We might be ready to roll. I think so, yeah. So let me uh, introduce you. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Brothers from Time to Time uh, with David Landau, um, a history of the Cuban Revolution with notes on its writing and publication, and I hope a wonderful conversation. Uh, my name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. And I work closely with the San Francisco Writers Conference um, to provide programs for writers. And so that's what this event is all about. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest in fact designed to serve the public uh, here in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. So right now, due to the shelter in place, all of our activities are virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year. And with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. So David Landau is our speaker today. Um, he is a mechanics member. I've personally known him for some 10 years. Uh, just out of college, just out of Harvard, he wrote a path-breaking book on Henry Kissinger. This was in the early, mm, I won't say, but. <laughs> <laughs> 1972. 1972. Let's, let's not be shy about it. <laughs> Um, and then in the early 90s, he wrote the first edition of the book that we're going to talk about today, um, Brothers, uh, from time to time. <clears throat> and a quarter century later, uh, he decided to uh, slim it down, uh, make it leaner, make it tougher. And, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And publish it myself. Or pub and publish, co publish with with uh, a, a partner, a real partner in uh, Central America, who was quite crazy about the book, and uh, I guess the choice for me was to was to to try again with the New York literary world, and um, I, I finally decided could could be done better by us with all of our knowledge and all of our contacts and and our interest. So um, that's. That's, and, and by the way, the self-publication is the thing, curiously enough, that allows me to share the, the PDF, the interior of the book, the text of the book with all of you. If I were publishing with one of the combines in New York, I'd be told, uh, no, no, you, you, can't, you can't do that. Um, but, uh, or I might be told, I don't know. But, but uh, in, in, in any case, this, this gives me a lot, of, a lot of latitude with the book. So really so, since, uh, Taryn? Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say um, uh, the way we should probably handle the uh, questions is um, since we do want this to be a conversation, but there's so many of you, why don't you um, alert me in the chat space that you have a question and then when it is when there's a break in David's talk, then we'll, um, we'll, we'll ask that question. You can ask him directly, but just let me know in the chat space. Yeah, actually, right. I think that, thanks, Taryn. I think, I think the questions are the primary thing. Um, that's, that's one of the, the nice uh, features of, of having everybody, uh, or at least having given everybody a chance to look at the book. So th there might be questions out there and I, I tend to think that your questions and my answers are a better way to do this than for me to talk and tell you what I think is important in the book, which <laughs> it might not have anything at all to do with your with your reading. Um, though I am I am prepared also to do that. So so I want to be um, responsive to the interests and the concerns in this group. So let's let's just say that that we are open for questions at, uh, at any time. And um, I, can, I can fill the space in between the questions with what I say. So this, this book is really the culmination of a 30-year 
effort, more than 30 years. Uh, in, it was in 1989 in, in Washington, DC that I first, that I met the, uh, the characters in this book. And um, that, that was a gentleman by the name of Emilio Adolfo Rivero. In the book, he is called Amy. Uh, and his younger brother is Adolfo. And I think what, what we immediately discovered in common was that we were ferocious nonconformists. And from very different backgrounds and very different parts of the of the universe, um, in in 1989, Amy Rivero had been living in Washington for 10 years. Uh, he was known in the circle I inhabited as "quote unquote" the ex political prisoner. That that was his moniker, and I thought that he was that really he had stepped from, from the pages of a Dostoevsky novel. He, he, was, he was completely out of his native time and place. He was immediately distinct from others in the room. I was attending a kind of uh, Washington soiree, sort of, um, you know, on the bohemian side. And uh, what, what Amy and the host had in common was that they had both been selected by some independent entity as uh, two of the most intelligent people in the United States. There are, you know, there are these groupings. And um, my, my friend, uh, Andy Schmuckler, who is a philosopher and a writer, uh, introduced me to, to Emilio Adolfo Rivero, or Amy. And um, I, I was immediately taken with him, and, and fortunately, there was there was chemistry there. Um, he was he was actually looking for a place to live um, at the time, and I, I was living by myself in a nine room house. Um, it was it was the house I had from from a divorce, and um, anyway, he moved in. He moved in, and when he did, the the entire his, his massive and compelling history moved in, into the house with him. A few months, no, not a few months, a few weeks, maybe a few days later, his brother, younger brother Adolfo, he, who had been, who had just left Cuba in 1989, 1988, I'm sorry, uh, and had been um, accepted as, as uh, an exile in France. He had been granted asylum by the French government. Um, had been living in Paris for a year and came to and came to Washington D.C. Um, and uh, he took a he took a room really very close to where to where Amy and I were living. So uh, I, I I was I was suddenly deeply immersed in in their world, which was a fascinating world and a world I had I had no inkling of. I I I come from a very specific. Uh, educational and social um, designation. I, I am an Ivy League educated classical liberal who believes deeply, among other things, in the New York Times <laughs> and and what and the the world view that the Times presents. The first thing the first thing one reads uh, in the morning is the New York Times. And I in the in the good old days or jolly old days of print newspapers, I, I used to have it too two or three foot high um, tower of unread New York Times uh, newspapers. And I expected at some point I'd, I'd get through them. Um, but anyway, the view of Cuba and that history, which, which came to me live by virtue of these, of these uh, two gentlemen was completely at variance with what I had learned at Harvard and what I read in the New York Times, this was the, my, my entire, I think I was really changing politically anyway uh, in the late eighties. I was, I was a, a veteran of the student left and I was, um, I, I was then kind of uh, more interested in what was called the new age. Um, 
human potential. And um, I, I, I really still consider myself a child of the, of the new age. That's my, that would be my designation. If somebody says to me, well, what are your politics? I would say, <laughs> you know, the best, the best summary would be to say new age. Um, but this was a, this, this, this view of, it's not view of Cuba. I mean, these were, these were participants as well as observers in, in a very crucial history, which Americans did not understand at all. Um, the way they understood it. And uh, I, they, they, their vision of the thing really supplanted quickly what I, what I knew or what I thought and, and what was all around me, Washington, 1989. Um, so, um, so the book really grew out of my uh, proximity, my closeness and my, my acquaintance with these, with these two gentlemen who then introduced me to a whole uh, group of, of uh, um, Cuban Americans or, or um, Cubans living, living in the United States. And uh, I, I, I suddenly was, was, was in that and I was seeing, I was seeing my society from their viewpoint rather than being somebody in this society and seeing, uh, seeing these guys from, from that viewpoint. And um, the book, the book came out of that. And it, it was, it was really more than, <laughs> than a sort of superficial exploration of historical and even personal issues. We, we really went quite deep and I wanted, I wanted to make sure that I, that I, that I was getting what I felt was, was the real story. And that is not easy because uh, these, these gentlemen had, had both been involved in, in really quite strenuous um, historical experience. They had both been in political prison. Uh, they, had, uh, they had been extensively interrogated by um, security officials of the Castro regime. And uh, that's not a picnic, as you can imagine. And uh, at the same time, they, they really had their, they, they were above and beyond their experiences. And I was, was fascinated by how that, how that could happen. That was not, that was not a view of, of, uh, of people and humanity. Uh, that I that I had been accustomed to having the view is we are we are shaped by our experiences we are marked by our experiences in we are humbled by our experiences we can be hindered or crippled by our experiences these guys were just not like that at all they they stood on top of what they had lived and that too was a, was a very fascinating thing for me. Um, I would say crucial in a way in my own personal development. When I met them, I was in my late thirties. That's still an impressionable age. And uh, I, 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 I felt I was being mentored by the tremendous experiences that they had had and the, uh, the way in which they had uh, adapted to their realities and, and, and really finally stood above what had, what had been done to them. Uh, Cuba after, let's say 1952, uh, is, it's one of the, it's one of the societies, uh, one of the global societies that has been tremendously, uh, shaken by revolution and political conflict. And um, their lives and their families' lives took them straight through the center of that. So the book, I wrote, I wrote my book 
um, I think I called it A Case of Two Brothers. I don't even remember the title. Um, and uh, it, it, it didn't get published. Let's just say it that way. <laughs> and um, I went on to do other things. I was, I was really caught after that by Cuba. I became, shortly after that, a, a, a publisher of books about Cuba and written um, one or in one case by me. And then that was, not the, that was not the brother's story. That was a novel, which I decided to self-publish. Uh, again, having, having uh, not, not really uh, attracted the interest of New York publishers. And then, uh, and then I published a, a, a load of, of, um, uh, of other really wonderful books by um, Cuban American writers. Actually, the only, the only writer in that group who is not Cuban American um, is, uh, is one author who is, who is still in Cuba, or at least still uh as last i knew he was he was still living in cuba so it's a book it's a book for uh cuban um cuban writers who are distant from their uh from their homeland and uh still dealing with it so i i i did that uh the publisher was the publishing enterprise was uh, was a critical success um, I'm still working on making it financially successful. Anyway, that imprint is called Pure Play Press. So Pure Play Press is, is the publisher of record for this book. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I have it in, in Pure Play Press. So I think, let, let me encourage uh, the listeners here to, to ask any questions they, they might have about this book or uh, what they're wondering about it or what they've encountered in it or what they would like to hear from me about it. Yeah, um, Barbara Massey has a question. Barbara, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask directly? Um, I was, I read the book and um, enjoyed it very much, but um, I was wondering about the dialogues that seem very vivid in your um, book and they're very compelling, but I was curious as I was reading it, are these like quotes of the conversations that you got from the brothers themselves or are these reimagined conversations? Well, the basis, the basis for almost everything in the book is what I heard or heard from the brothers or read of the brothers. The brothers actually wrote pieces of uh, memoirs. They would they would take a specific uh, episode in uh, their lives and write uh, about them. And uh, much much dialogue was included. And it's a it's a it's a subsidiary issue, but a lot of it in Spanish. So this is this is also. Um, a linguistic translation on, on my part. I, I've, um, I've, made, I've made the dialogue, I think, maybe a little, a little, I don't know. I just, I, I wanted it to read well. I wanted to represent them <laughs> as, as best I could. And, and they are tremendously talented writers, both of them, really strikingly good and with, with very clear memories. So the, the goal in this book was history and as, as close to the thing itself that I could possibly make it. But I do think that in, in imagination and, and truth are, are, not, are not opposites. They are, <laughs> I think in order, in order to see something accurately you have to imagine it first and so i was i was fortunate to be able to imagine what what how these guys had lived and how their their um their fellow cubans uh, had had lived 
what it, what it was like in their society. And I, I, I had a fairly good idea about it. By the way, I'm, 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 one of the things about which I'm proudest is that the, um, we, we, we do have people who, who lived very close to these characters. Um, for example, in this, in this very meeting, we have, we have Irma Alicia Price, who is uh, who has become a great friend of mine? She is the daughter of Amy Rivero. Oh. She was born. She was born in um, uh, in. You were born in Cuba, weren't you? Oh, yeah. I, I, 19, 1958. and uh, and then she moved to the United States, in nineteen sixty one. It was actually. I don't want to get emotional about this. <laughs> But at a certain point, when I was deciding to write the book, and, and they, the brothers were deciding whether they really wanted me to write this book, Irma said to me, you are certainly the one to write this book. And that, that made a tremendous difference. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to have her companionship and support in this, uh, in this project. Um, there are a couple of other uh, people who are, who are very, very close. Uh, Adolfo's son, Alejandro, um, he might be here or might not. He, he told me he was, he was going to try to, to stop in, so here to speak. Hi, Alejandro. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, Primo. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm great. I'm great. So, I'm not Alejandro. Sure. I'm not sure how to um, request uh, to say something here. I don't Zoom often, so I'm going to raise my hand just to- No, just, just talk, <laughs> please. From what Barbara had said, uh, as far as the dialogue in the book, and I also will get emotional um, reading the book and the translations, it's as if I can hear my father and my uncle speak. And I think David, you know, he says a lot of it, you know, he imagined of how it was. The truth is my uncle and my father repeated these stories all the time, shared stories all the time. He'd see us and say, did I ever tell you when? And he'd repeat the stories. And yes, they did their memoirs. So I'm reading this book and I think it's so accurate in the translation and in the words, so accurate. And I think Ale would agree with me. It's as if we can hear them speak. Thank you. Um, I, ha I have a question, but first I wanna say that uh, I haven't read all of it yet, but I went to the back. I wanted to see the thing as a whole. So I love the index and, and I particularly love the ending of the epilogue and that help me when you talk about a life well lived and it's sort of this final gesture to the characters in this book. And, um, and I know it's a work of history, but I was thinking again about like say Frank Bedard, the poet who talks about the compassionate imagination. And I felt like this is a, a work of a scholarship, but also of a compassionate scholarship. And I don't mean that in a sentimental way, but you know, you speak earlier about how it changed you when you saw how they stood upon and above the circumstances of their lives. And I think that I'm about a third of the way through the book, but I think that that's evident from, you know, from the very, very beginning. I, I, I just think it's, uh, it's, um, I, I just love that about the book. That's what occurred to me this morning when I was thinking about, about it. That's what I really, really love is that operation of a compassionate intellect and a compassionate um, imagination and a compassionate memory and, and a compassionate um, rigor. I, I, I think that's a wonderful combination. Um, my question is a little different. Uh, it's about form because I know that you have, are a playwright and I know that you really uh, very knowledgeable about music, particularly I know of your uh, love and interest in classical music. So I was wondering, even though the primary characters were very verbal and wrote and 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 you and, and all of that, and you have your literary skills, was there ever a time when you when you decided this is going what I'm going to do is going to be a book? Did, did you ever consider before that? 
or since then, it might also be, you know, uh, a play. I mean, you know, you, you're you're one of the few writers I know who work in several art forms. So I was thinking about you as a playwright as I was reading this also, partly because it's very dialogue heavy and wonderful that way. And partly because um, I know you have a passion for theater and, you know, and, and, and you could go both ways or, or, you know, so I just wondered, was it always um, a literary form that you envisioned um, from the beginning that when you would do something and, and, and did that stay true for 30 years or did you kind of wonder, oh, maybe it would be interesting as a, a libretto, <laughs> you know, for an opera or maybe it would be. Great not question. Everybody, not everybody can ask those questions. You know, I can't, <laughs> but you can. <laughs> Well, you can ask a lot. Mary, Mary Rako is a great friend and a wonderful novelist and uh, superb at what she does. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled and awed to have her interest. Um, yeah, the answer is, the short answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I started working on this book, you know, in my, in my tender, you know, 1930, uh, tender 30s, <laughs> 1989, I, uh, I, I didn't have the, uh, I didn't have the scope that I, that I'm, that I, that you're attributing to me now or crediting to me now. Oh, okay. I'd never written a play. Actually, it was my experience as a publisher. This was, this was really fascinating. And this is a side note, but if you ever want to, you know, develop yourself and deepen yourself as a writer, work with other writers and help those people do what they want to do. It doesn't take you away from your own <laughs> craft, or it does, you know, in terms of the hours and the dedication, but working with other people on their stuff gave me incredible scope. Uh, and um, one of the things that, that really was formative was, was translating a, a, a cycle of sonnets yeah, by, by Nestor Diaz de Villegas, it really, uh, wonderful Cuban writer and poet, and I I, uh, I translated his uh, a cycle of sonnets about the Marquis de Sade, and it was <laughs> it was <laughs> it was really that was a wild experience, and and um, and I was you know I was quite closely questioned by people who love Nestor's uh, work, and you know how was how was I going to be able to do this? It's a, it's a kind of question that comes up in literary things. So how, what qualifies you, you to, do, to, un, to undertake? <laughs> and my answer to that, my answer to that was to say, well, I don't really know what, what qualifies me to do this. Maybe I'm the only one who is um, dumb enough to be that <laughs> intrepid <laughs> to do it. But anyway, that was a, that was a great that was a great experience because after translating Nestor's poems, I realized I could I could translate anything from Spanish to 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 English. And uh, actually, another another participant in this meeting is a, is a wonderful Spanish uh, language writer. Um, actually, she writes in two languages: Teresa Doval Page. I'm I'm delighted to see Teresa here today. And Teresa's, Teresa's uh, I, I published, I think, Teresa's first Spanish language book, uh, the, the first of her Spanish language books to be presented to an American audience. I, I published that, that book in Pure Play Press. The book is called uh, Posesas de la Habana, which, which I translate as Haunted Ladies of Havana. And uh, I, I, I mean to translate that book into into English, um, I, I am I am that might be one of my next projects, but um, but anyway, as far as Brothers is concerned, I'm now looking at it in with with many different possibilities, uh, and one of them is the graphic novel, mm. which takes me actually very close to 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 uh, screenwriting or playwriting, and it changes the whole it changes the whole thing. Uh, when you when you when you write in different forms, you don't simply try to <laughs> replicate what right. you know what one form has. You, you, it, it, the whole thing it's a, it's another way of looking at this story. My my great friend Amy Rivero told me 
one time, David, you don't need, once you have Cuba, you don't need anything else. <laughs> that was a, that was a very optimistic statement. What he, what he meant to say was, and he was, the thing about Amy Rivero is that he, he, having spent 18 and a half years in prison, he became one of the world's great readers and connoisseurs of literature. He read everything that he could, that he could get his hands on. And when he, when he commented about, about my um, work, I knew I was, I, was, I was hearing from a master reader. And when he, when he said, when he made the comment about, about um, uh, you know, with Cuba, you have, you have everything. Uh, I, I, I really like that. Speaking of reading, so, David, um, Emily was wondering if you would read a few passages that especially resonate with you. Okay, let me, let me look for something short. But, uh, hi, Emily. <laughs> Um, I, I have one that, 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 that might be very interesting in terms of the political, uh, well, let me, let me do this. This is, this is better. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that I really want to see people paying attention to in this, uh, in this book is the story of the first Cuban human rights movement, which was in a way co-invented by uh, Adolfo Rivero, Amy's brother. And uh, Adolfo developed a relationship with a gentleman called Ricardo Bofil and the experience that they had in common was that they were members of the Communist Party who had become, who had, who had, had, had differences with, with uh, Fidel Castro. Um, and they felt because they were loyal members of the regime, they, they should be allowed to say what they thought. It was only natural for them they were, uh, they were, they were, they saw themselves as free men. Um, the, the, the commandante, the, the, uh, the Fidel Castro didn't see it, didn't see it that way. No, the, <laughs> that was not his idea. So Adolfo and Ricardo Bofil wound up in prison in 1980. And this is, a, this is a dialogue between Adolfo and Ricardo. Ricardo says, I have something that can turn the entire situation around in Cuba. And Adolfo had his, you know, he was, he was ready to, to, to absorb this. And he was looking at it, you know, still as a, as a traditional communist intellectual and ideologue. And so this, this, this conversation takes place in prison in 1980. Country is going through a very strenuous period. There's a lot of emigration to the United States. This is the time of the so-called Marielle boat lift where 130,000 Cubans over the course of a few months just ran from the, ran from the island. And Adolfo, it, Adolfo was basically arrested because Fidel did not want him, Adolfo, to leave, did not want him to go out with the other, with the other people. And there were lots and lots of people leaving at the time. So Adolfo was arrested to keep him in Cuba because Fidel did not want his political enemies to go outside of Cuba and talk about what happened, what was happening in Cuba. And Bofil, the same thing. There are political prisoners 
in this enormous prison called Combinado del Este, and all around them, common criminals, uh, every, everything from uh, juvenile delinquents to um, thieves to rapists and killers are being taken out of their prison cells by the regime and put on boats to go to the United States. But Adolfo and Ricardo have to sit in prison and watch this happen. So, combinado. Adolfo started to visit Bofil in the other man's prison quarters. Bofil happened to live in a cell, more private than a galera. Galera is a, a room with about 50 prisoners living in it. His fellow activists, Elizardo Sanchez and Enrique Hernandez, also lived close by. So Bofil's was an ideal meeting place. Tell me about your group, Adolfo asked Bofil. You say you have everything organized. What's your program? What's your ideology? What's your strategy? Bofil. We have none of that. Everything is above board. Nothing is hidden. We don't conspire. Adolfo. But that's fatal. How do you manage without those things? Bofil. The question is, how would I manage with those things? Fidel has defeated every program, every ideology, every strategy, every conspiracy that goes against him. The way to beat him is to stand up and refuse to take shit while giving him no nothing to attack. Adolfo. And how do you do that? Look, this government can do anything it wants. You know it and I know it. But the government can't say it does anything it wants. It has to pretend people have some rights. They have to obey the Constitution. I know the Constitution is crap. Everybody knows it's crap. But the Constitution is important because it gives you a space in which to work. It's a tiny space, a tiny, tiny space, a minimum space, but you can work with it. Adolfo. No, Bofield continues. So when the government is screwing over some guys, we just tell the government, look, you can't screw over those guys. The law doesn't allow you. And guess what? It's true. They can't tell you to shut up because that would be forbidding you to speak. The government never admits to taking away your right to speak. The most they ever do is intimidate you from using your right. They can't accuse you of ideological deviation because you're using the law, which is their fucking ideology. Okay, they can throw you in jail, but sooner or later they have to let you out. Their best tactic is to ignore you. If your boss ignores you, you write a letter to his boss. Pretty soon you are writing to the national bosses, then to the bosses of international communism. Finally, when nothing else works, you write to the international human rights organizations. You are making all this noise and Fidel doesn't have a goddamn fucking thing to say about it. Adolfo, you mean that's all there is to it? Telling them they can't screw over so-and-so? That's the big idea they're so afraid of? Bofil, that's it, Adolfo. But you've got to have a program. How else do you expect to win people to your ideas? Ricardo, the basic idea is not to take shit from sons of whores. It might not sound like a big idea, but actually it is. Everyone has, ha everyone has this idea deep inside. So we're going to demonstrate it and hold open the door for other people to join. Adolfo, how many are you? Ricardo, let's see. Elizardo, Enrique, myself. Right now, it's the three of us. Adolfo, you are three? That's what you mean by having things organized? <laughs> Ricardo, how many people did Fidel have when he started out in the, in the Sierra? 20, 10, five? Adolfo, on that point, you are absolutely correct, Ricardo. The point is not how many you have, but how many you might have. It begins from one. From one, you get three or four. Three or four people who put their minds to it can change a country. Adolfo, and what about your strategy? Ricardo, our strategy is to have no strategy. 
That way no one can figure out our next move. Many times I don't even know what I'm going to do before I do it. Of course, that means security doesn't know either and they can't use their methods against me. How curious, Adolfo thought dismissively. But then as he reflected on the beating of the boat kids, Ophiel's idea took hold of him. Adolfo became a regular visitor to Bofil's cell. For the first time in years, he had a new excitement for what he loved best. Instead of wearing widow's black for the socialist idea, Adolfo could take the part of actual people whom the system had mistreated. Bofil, with lines of information everywhere, had bags of stories about guys who had been beaten up. For Adolfo, those stories were the limit. After his personal downfall, Adolfo had insisted in letters to his parents, yes, but people go to prison here because they have acted against the state. The authorities mistreat no one. Beatings are unheard of. And now, every day, Bofil had stories of new beatings. That's, that's, that's what I like. So. More, more questions? Well, uh, sure, nobody else. Yeah, may I? Oh, Go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, so. That's Mike Larson, who was the, the, uh, uh, the head of the, the inventor and the head of the San Francisco Writers Conference for a long time. Inventor. But um, so David, what perspective would you like to have the people here to have uh, about, about Cuba? about Fidel and about his role in the world. What's, what's the, you know, what's, what's your overall perspective now based on everything you know? Uh, um, what would you want, what do you want people to think about it? And there's a follow-up question if you get through that, but that's not a small one. Cuba, Fidel, and, and its role in the world. What I, what I really would like, thank you. I, what I really would, I've got to, I'm, I'm just, uh, fiddling with this, this uh, headphone. Um, what, what I really would like actually is, is for people to pay more attention to Cuba and to what, and, and also to the to countries in Central America in which I've, which I've done a lot of things. Um, I, I, uh, I kind of take Ricardo Bofield's idea about this after a long, period of you know having political viewpoints and arguing and discussing with people i i think i i want people i just want people to 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 be interested and to draw the conclusions that they can that they can draw but but it's that's not a small thing because we have we have you know in 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 this country it's a kind of um there there is a kind of uh how how shall i say uh, maybe it's a myopia, a short-sightedness, indifference to uh, the countries with whom we share the the, uh, the hemisphere. And uh, I, I want I want Americans to know more about these societies. The more I hear about immigration crisis and you know it's, it's all of, all of the all of the all of the short phrases that are uh, you know the violence, the poverty, the corruption. I I want people. Involved, I want I want them interested. I've I've been very richly rewarded by my own involvement in in these countries, Cuba and Guatemala especially. And by the way, I was led led to Guatemala by by Amy Rivero, who um, uh, who, who who got me uh, involved in in some political process there. And it's 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 fantastic. I mean, to to know what what I know, I I feel. I've been, you know, I've been richly, richly rewarded for the, for the, um, you know, the time and, and uh, difficulty that I've had in, in uh, acquiring this knowledge. This is, these are great countries and these are great people. And um, it's, it's, uh, they, sh they should be closer to us. They should be better known. How could the new administration make things better between the United States and Cuba? <laughs> 50 words or less, please. Well, 
by by looking by looking at the thing a little more carefully than than they already have i think that uh i think that whatever administration comes to power um in the united states is is looks at looks at this looks at these issues in a kind of careless way or in a way that is politically expedient um and i i i I am hoping against hope that 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 they will will be thoughtful. David, we have a question um, by Sheila. Okay. Sheila, do you want to turn your mic on? Hi there. Hi. Um, I have several questions actually. Um, I was taken by the idea also, which was brought up earlier, that this could be theater, because, you know five minutes into reading it, it, there was a large amount of dialogue which went back and forth and back and forth. And I visualized it on a stage, not necessarily in reality, but uh, on a stage. That's just a comment. But I was wondering if you're familiar with a movie called Yuli, Y-U-L-I. No, no, tell me about it. It's, a, it's about, um, his last name is Acosta, I think it's Carlos. He's actually a ballet dancer from Cuba. He ended up in Britain. Um, but the part of that movie that grabbed me mostly was talking about how after Castro came to power that there was an attempt to build a, an art center, but they had no money. And I believe to this day that because the Soviets wouldn't fund that. They would fund other things, but they wouldn't fund the art center. And so I mm. think the buildings are still there as hollow shells. I don't know if they're being put to any use now or not, but um, I kind of saw that as a, maybe a metaphor for the revolution. Um, but it's a movie that I would recommend to everybody. It may be available at the moment on Netflix, rather recent, mm -hmm. it's Y-U-L-I. Um, the trust of it is about the, the protagonist as a dancer, but it's also about politics. And, uh, and the third thing I was going to go off on about was um, the need for us to not have linguistic blinders on all the time. Um, and I think that we need to, in this country, we need to really address issues in our educational system, which still thinks primarily uh, in English and only thinks as bilingual education as kind of an add-on. Um, whereas in reality, it's a way to open up the way you think about the world. So that's enough for now. <laughs> that, that would be a, that would be a great, a great thing, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to communicate in in languages there yeah there i i think i think that that we don't we don't do enough in foreign languages americans do not given given that english is a kind of lingua franca and has been for a long time we've been spoiled many other people around the world speak to us in our language and uh, we should be we should be doing a little more speaking to them in theirs i agree David, would you like to discuss the uh, the photographs? Let's let's look at um, let's look let's look at the photographs of Adolfo. Okay. Uh, now we've got now we've got we've got all of them here, right? Oh, this yes. is this is this is this is. This is I start Let's, with this one. <laughs> let, let me start with this. This is this is the back cover of the forthcoming Spanish edition, and I'm just I'm I'm I just love the I love the collage. It just it 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 was created by um, uh, a book a really good book designer who was who was working with me, and um, the the portrait in the center uh, is. Um, it's a, obviously a drawing of uh, Amy uh, at, at, as a prisoner. This, this, and this was done by a fellow prisoner. Um, 
and I, I, I have, don't have any idea who actually did it. And uh, Amy and Adolfo are, are gone. They, they, they can't speak for themselves anymore. I'm hoping that whoever, whoever did that drawing will come forward and identify uh, himself or herself probably himself and it seems to have been a, a work created in in prison or during prison maybe after but with the memory very strong and uh this this really captures for me the, the essence of the uh, of the man and and uh, what he lived um going from the um the lower left these are mom and dad la vieja and el viejo of Adolfo and uh, Amy. And uh, this picture was taken in early 1961. They're in Miami. And uh, they, uh, they're, they're just, you know, I, I, I simply adore the, the, the portrait. Right above them is a, is a photo of Adolfo in, I would say 1962. He's wearing the, the fashionable olive green uh, guerrilla outfit. Uh, the, he, this is a heyday of Adolfo's communist period. Right above Adolfo is a, a, a single column with a headline from the New York Times. This is a, this is a notable um, headline from, from uh, the date of the date of the article is January third, nineteen ninety nine. Uh, at the time, the New York Times was was really the uh, you know a, a strong proponent of the Castro regime and remains so um, for many decades and and in a way still is. But uh, every ten years, the Times celebrated the um, the birth of the Castro regime with some kind of commemorative article or articles. In, in 1999, there were two of them. And this one, Castro talk shows him still a rebel and prophet. Okay. So um, this is how the Times is seeing a 40-year-old absolutist regime. And, you know, the question, <laughs> question in my mind you know, can he be a prophet? Sure, but can he be a rebel after after being head of the Cuban state for forty years? This is very typical of the New York Times. Anyway, I I wanted I wanted that to be on the on the cover. Um, going going clockwise, um, this this is a this is a, a Polaroid taken of the two brothers. Adolfo on the left, Amy on the right, May 1960. This is the height of their of their conflict, and uh, they are they have met at the insistence of their parents, who were already in the United States, and called Amy and said, "Would you please locate your brother? We don't even know where he is, and have a meeting with him just to see that he's all right." So the two brothers meet in May 1960. They're, they're on their way to lunch in a Chinese restaurant. And uh, just, you know, the occasional portrait. Um, this, is a, this is a great, a great portrait. Um, underneath that is my coy way of demonstrating <laughs> what, what some very generous critic has said about this book. This is a review in the Washington Times and the headline is, is from September of this year. And rather than, having, rather than having the quote splayed across the back cover, I just, uh, I just take the headline and, and you know, I ask the illustrator to include it in the collage. The, uh, the last photo, which is beneath, is a photo that I took in Havana in 2002. And Adolfo had given that the city of Havana 22 years earlier, the title City on Crutches um, because of, the, uh, because of the, the, the deteriorating state of Havana and uh, really the, the, um, the very superficial um, 
measures which had been taken to keep buildings propped up. So these are uh, um, these are, are wood wooden supports. And this is the, the Malacon of Havana. So this is not a side street. This is the main avenue and, and one of uh, Havana's most famous streets. And it's, it would be like, it would be like, uh, what, what would be the equivalent? Uh, in, I, I always like to, to compare to New York, being a New Yorker. This, the, the Malacon is, is as famous as Fifth Avenue or Madison Avenue. This is one of the great streets of the city. And to have that there is, is uh, it, it illustrates something. So anyway, that's the back cover um, of the Span of the forth forthcoming Spanish edition. This is a portrait of uh, Amy in 1961, and the occasion is Irma Alicia's third birthday. Irma Alicia, three years old, on the on the left, and her brother Ruben uh, on the right. Uh, picture photo is taken in Miami in um, early 1961. Let's let's see the next one. This <laughs> this is great. This is this is Irma Alicia, 20 year old young lady, with her dad meeting her dad at Miami International Airport when he arrives. He's this is the first time. She's seeing him since the occasion in the earlier photograph. Um, you see, she's she's pointing with her uh, with her right forefinger, and whom she's pointing to is her brother Ruben, who's taking the picture. This is a, this is sheer joy captured in 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 the camera's lens. That's a great okay. picture. Now this is Alejandro with his dad, Adolfo. Alejandro might, might be seven, eight years old, uh, playing chess, obviously. Adolfo, this, is, this would be in the late um, 1970s in Havana. And I see that uh, newspaper Le Monde is, you know, this is from the days of... Uh, print newspapers. So um, this, this is, there were, there were two things that just swept Adolfo up in his life. The first, his love of politics and the whole game of politics. And the second was the tremendous love that he had for his son. Okay. Let's go to the next. Now this, this reflects Adolfo's love of politics. Uh, the person on the, on the left with the, with the hand raised and the beer bottle in the other hand, this is Ricardo Bofil, the creator of the Cuban human, human rights movement. I took this photo in Adolfo's apartment in Miami. 1990s, maybe 1992, and Adolfo is is uh, is just um, I don't I don't know how clearly you can see him, but he's he's absolutely this is this this is another expression of sheer joy, the the joy of um, uh, of plotting, of conspiring, of brainstorming, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this this. This is the way I'll always see these, these two gentlemen. Okay, let's go to the next one. Ah, <laughs> my favorite headline from the New York Times, January 2nd, 1999. In city of Castro's triumph, most still back him. Okay. Well, you know, there's a lot that you can say about this. Um, uh, I won't. I won't. I won't say it. Um, but uh, but anyway, um, I'll let it. I'll let it speak for itself. Okay. And then this is this uh, this is the image that that you've already seen on the back cover of the book. I just I just like to know how our great journalistic brains 
are covering these important historical phenomena. So uh, you, uh, you see it for yourself. All right, we have a question from Zara, and then that should probably be one of our last questions. Um, okay. He asks, what is the impact of the brothers on your liberalism? And do you still read the New York Times the same way that you did when you met them? Ah, well, <laughs> probably not. Um, I would like to say for the record, and if anybody asks, I subscribe to the New York Times I mean, commercially, I subscribe to it. Intellectually, I really don't. But I get, the, I, get, I get the New York Times every day. And, you know, you can, you can take, you can take the, the Times away from a boy, but you can't, you can't, you can't uh, I don't know. I, I, I blew that one, but I think you, you knew where I was going. Um, the, the, the Times is in my bloodstream. But I also get it. Really, it's it's opportunistic. I'd like to know. Uh, it's it is it has been for a long time for for 150 years the paper of record, and for most of that time it, it was fairly faithful to that mission. So uh, so the Times and its reporters have been uh, witnesses to history, whether they've been flawed witnesses or good witnesses, it doesn't matter. But they you know it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a viewpoint. Same with the Post, Washington Post. Um, but no, I, you know, everything, everything comes to me. I, I, I look at what, what's presented on, uh, when, when it's presented and, and I, don't, I you know, nothing, nothing really else to say. I appreciate the, the, the wit behind the, the question. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions that they'd like to pose directly to David? Mary? Um, I looked at the website of the press last night and to see what else you guys have been publishing and stuff like that. Um, and there was uh, a sense that uh, the possibility of expanding, and I didn't know just, just a writers that I know that are working on manuscripts. I wondered how it was going to go. And after this conversation, I hope that by expanding, you mean maybe looking at Cuba from other angles, like a book just from the arts, like about this dancer or something like that. I mean, it seemed because you talk so passionately about um, uh, us in the, uh, in the United States uh, being more informed about Cuba, Guatemala, you know, the, the other people with whom we share this hemisphere. So I just wondered what the vision, you know, kind of what you, besides the upcoming Spanish translation of this book, you know, what is a vision that you and your uh, colleagues at the press are sort of thinking about? It's a weird time in publishing, but I think it's probably always a weird time in publishing. So, you know, I, I wouldn't expect that would stop you. And um, kind of just curious uh, what, what, what you might be dreaming about, you know, for the press. I'd, I'd love to be able to be a general publisher some sometime. I mean, the, my, my first focus was Cuba because that was what really um, impassioned me, shall we, shall we say. But, um, but I, I'm, I'm really open to, to anything having to do okay. with, with, with culture, literature, history. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, it, it, it really all depends on what I can do and the economics and all of that. And I, I, I would love for, for Pure Play Press at some point to be able to succeed uh, commercially. Uh -huh. And we'll, we'll, you know, that, that'll be a neat trick when we, when we get it there. But, but really anything that I, that I want to read, I, I'll assume other people will want to read it as well, so. So you're very quite open then. I mean, because there are authors that are not going to measure their dreams in terms of commercial success. They want to be published by a, a publisher whose work they like and, and, and who will help them get reviews and stuff like that. So it wouldn't have to be someone who is working in Cuba related material. You would no, be, not, you not, would at be not at all, not at all. Okay, I will yeah. keep that in mind for clients. 
Yeah, and the you know the Mike Mike has something to say on this. I, I think it's going to be Jermaine. <laughs> oh well, no, I was just going to ask about uh, what sources of news information, David, do you rely on? Do you recommend to people to get uh, for, for reliable information about what's going on in the world? Are there? <laughs> <laughs> The best, I think the best. I think the best we can do, any of us, is to is to read everything we can, and apply the best um, critical filters that we have to what we read. There's there's a lot of crap out there. Let me say that. Um, I think we all know that. But uh, but I find. Um, I mean, I I have I have I I have a weakness for Wikipedia, for example. Now that it's that that might seem uh, kind of odd, but I but I think that that uh, be, when you when you when you take your education, your critical faculties, and you apply them as best you can to whatever you see, that that's the best the best source best source of news is you yourself, really, and and uh, and what you can find and how you can um, how you can use it. Great answer. <laughs> well, are there any other questions? Um, because otherwise I'd like to thank David for coming and uh, really sort of rocking our world with the, this discussion about uh, brothers from time to time. I would, I would say, look, any, anybody in, um, please stay in touch with me, all of you. Um, if you have a book project you want to discuss, I'm, you know, I, I can help with that. Um, but, but anyway, uh, I, um, you know, I love you all and, and uh, please uh, stay in touch. And do, you thank mind you if I put your, do you mind if I put your email address in the chat space? You've been, hand, you've been emailing all our guests already. But just to remind people. <laughs> please do. Um, yeah, if you don't, if you'd like a copy of the book, you can email um, David directly. I'm going to put that in the chat space right now, and he'll send you the PDF. Um, but it's pureplayed at live.com. That's it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I suspect everybody has the, the PDF already. But, uh, but if you don't, let me know, and I'll send it in, you know, 10 seconds. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. Stay warm and stay healthy this holiday season. And thank you, David, for your um, your candid talk today. Well, thanks to all of you, and I really, really appreciate. You know, we are we are we are only as good as as the people with whom we're communicating. So uh, I feel I feel very blessed in 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 having you all. Thank you. Likewise, have a great weekend, everyone. And thanks for turning out today. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.